Today let's talk about concurrency in Clojure, and I just want to make this guide uh, really pragmatic and practical, so we will uh, ignore uh, quite a lot of concepts that are available in Clojure. For example, we won't talk about STM, software transactional memory, uh, refs, agents, and stuff like that. And instead, we will focus on things that are really used in production. So we will cover um, main things you need to know about uh, concurrency, threads, futures, and all that stuff. And it will cover 95% uh, of all needs you will encounter if you work with a production closure application. So let's talk about uh, immutability first, right? Uh, let's imagine we have a code, something like that. And imagine we are in old Java world. So we create an object and then we execute some function uh, that we don't really know what is doing. And it's, it could be a function from a library. It could be some other code that we have no idea how it works. Um, but after that, and, and we pass there uh, an object that we created. And in Java, we have no guarantee that uh, this function that we're calling will not uh, change the state of our object. But in Clojure, uh, we are safe because everything is immutable by default. So we pass uh, an object, we pass the value, but it, it could not be changed by a function. So only that um, removes the... Um, huge slice of problems related to concurrency and changing of the state. So we're good with that. But um, we still want uh, to use uh, some kind of threads uh, because we want to utilize the resources that are available to our uh, service and we want to run some processes in parallel and do stuff. Let's take a look uh, into a basic example how to create threads uh, with Java interop enclosure. So I prepared this small example and let's remove this sleep for now. So what's going on here is we're creating thread here. It could be with this new uh, keyword or uh, a shortcut for that will be just uh, a constructor of the thread, um, both working. So we create new thread and then we pass a function there. And basically this body, this function will be executed inside the thread. So it will not block our uh, current process. So let's um, execute that, run Java thread. And we see three uh, log statements, before thread, after thread, and from thread. And if we add a sleep, so it will delay this uh, info uh, log from, from the thread. Let's run it again. We see uh, our uh, function returned already, but after that we get a um, print fr from a different thread. So that's the basic example how uh, Java to closure interop works in terms of threads. There's quite a lot of boilerplate, I would say. So a better way to work with threads is to use, use futures in Clojure. And example of that could be something like this. Let's replace this thing. And let's see what's going on here. So first of all, uh, if we just want to uh, execute some uh, code on a, a thread, we can do just future call. So it will be, for example, we want to sleep a bit. Thread sleep, uh, one second. And then we want to log something uh, from future. Right, can remove this block for now. And let's execute run closure um, run closure for future. So we have this uh, from future uh, print line, right? Um, but we also can uh, block on the result of the future. So, uh, for example, we want uh, some return statement uh, from the future body. So uh, you see this final line here. So this result from future will be returned and we can assign our future to uh, a variable inside the led block. And after that, we can call this deref function that is uh, uh, will wait for the future to complete and it will return the value uh, from the future. So let's see that in action run future. So we see we're waiting a bit 
And after that, uh, when the future is finished, after one second, uh, we have a return statement. Let's increase the sleep so we see it better. We're waiting, and then we'll return that. If we remove this uh, DREF here, uh, our mm, run closure fun future function will uh, return nil immediately, so we don't block on, on this uh, line 16. A shortcut for um, DREF uh, future will be uh, at future, so it's uh, just a, a syntax sugar for DREF behavior is same. So we're getting this result from the future here, right? So this is uh, how to avoid uh, Java interrupt to create a thread. So we create a future and it uh, actually executes it on a, a built-in thread pool. Uh, so we don't have to care about creating threads. Cool. Um, and now let's see how we can uh, reuse futures uh, to uh, create uh, some performance improvements in our in our application. So I'll be using this uh, API uh, for demonstration purposes. So it's like a Pokemon API. And if we execute this one, uh, it will give us a uh, hundred uh, Pokemons with their URLs. And the idea is that uh, we uh, loop through these URLs and execute a get request to get the information from that URL. And uh, we want to fire a request for each of those URLs. So the uh, URLs block, if we execute this one, will be just a collection of URLs. And then we want to map uh, map over them. But first of all, we don't want futures inside. So let's say uh, instead of future, we just want to call uh, to get this uh, information uh, from the URL, uh, but it, it will be a single threaded uh, process, right? In that case, we don't need this DREF here. So our code is just simple. We get collection of URLs and we map over that. For each uh, of that URLs, we do a get call and then we do all to evaluate the lazy sequence that we get from the map. Uh, let's execute that. Uh, parallel requests. Right. It will take a while because we have a single thread uh, and we calling this get request one by one. Yeah, as you can see, it takes it takes a while, um, but and also there is a time function, so we can measure uh, how long our function call takes, and we want to hide the result, so we can do something like def result and we call time, and inside we do a parallel requests. So let's see how how long it takes. It takes a while, as we see. So how we can improve that is uh, instead of uh, creating, like uh, executing a request uh, for each URLs, we want to execute the same request, but inside a future. So for each request, there'll be like a thread on the thread pool uh, to so we don't block or, on on each call, right? So to do that, uh, just inside the map, we call uh, we do future and then we wrap our um, uh, get request inside the future, but uh, after that uh, we basically want to call map DREF on all of those and uh, do all in the end. So let's see that, uh, and we want uh, to, for example, time uh, parallel requests, and we see how much faster this call is now, right? So our requests are in parallel now. So this is a um, useful example how to use future uh, futures to um, parallelize your code. We now know how to spin multiple threads, how to execute our code in parallel. Uh, but what if we want uh, some state uh, that we want to share between our threads? Right, and we want to update it. It's a bit uh, tricky to demonstrate race conditions in Clojure because these devs basically cannot be modified from multiple threads with an easy uh, and good looking way. But I created this uh, example uh, to, to
to demonstrate the problem, right? So uh, what happens here is uh, we have this counter and I'm using this alter var root, which is not a recommended way, but just for demonstration purposes. So in, um, in the first line of the test, I'm setting it to zero. So I'm resetting this uh, state um, value of this uh, variable to, to zero. And then I have two, two futures and uh, both of them is doing uh, uh, a thousand uh, calls and uh, it's reading the uh, value of the counter then it increases it and then it resets the value and there is a second future doing the exactly the same at the end um, in, in parallel right so let's execute this block ink uh, count test right okay so it's uh, it's finished, but the value is not right, right? So we uh, do a thousand calls in the first future and a thousand call on the second future, but we get less than that. And it's because uh, we have the race condition. So the, th the future uh, gets the counter value. So it's uh, one here and one here. We do increment, increment here, and we set the counter to two, right? But actually it should be... Uh, it should be three, for example, because we uh, executed like the increment from two threads. So that's a classic example of race condition when you have read, write um, commands um, and you don't have a proper uh, thing to store your state uh, in atomic way. So you um, save uh, to update it from multiple threads. We can fix that with Atom. So now let's pick the, the other example. And we, we now use uh, the def, but inside we use uh, we wrap our value inside the atom. And atom can accept anything we want. So it could be just a uh, primitive, it could be a, a map inside, it could be any data structure. So uh, whatever you want to store as the shared state could go inside the atom. But on top of that, we have uh, functions to reset the atom. Uh, for example, our atom zero, and we want to set it to one, right? And now we have the uh, value one there. Um, and we also have a swap value, a swap uh, function that will do um, update of the value. So for example, we want increment uh, the value inside the atom. And this uh, swap and reset are guaranteed to be thread safe and they use uh, uh, compare and set logic inside. So um, it will get the value of the atom, apply the function uh, uh, that we specify here, like the function of the old state uh, of the atom, and then it will check that uh, uh, there was no changes from other threads. Uh, if there was a conflict, it will apply the value again. So we don't set uh, any value here. We provide a function to change the uh, atom state, and it's guaranteed to be thread safe um, and atomic. Cool. So let's see our example in action. So we have um, uh, atom now that uh, has zero at the beginning. We reset it to zero at the beginning of the test, so we can run multiple. Um, uh, run this function multiple times and then again we have future one future two but inside uh, we do swap and we do increment of the count right so let's uh, execute this one ink count item test yep and now we have expected value so um atoms are encountered a lot in real uh, application. So we have a, a reliable and easy way to share state between our threads in a thread uh, safe way. Cool. Just a bit more about the swap function. So let's say we have uh, our atom, state atom, right? And we want atom and we want a vector inside right so the swap function will be we provide a state atom at the first argument and then we uh, basically provide a function that takes an old value 
and we can update it here, right? So we can say, for example, um, how we want to update it. So maybe we want uh, conj and some value inside our vector, right? So we can write it here. So we want conj old value and we want to like add one there, right? So we, when we're calling this uh, uh, swap, we're basically adding extra one at the end of, of the atom. And if we uh, deref the state atom, we see we see the value. And also, this could uh, accept extra arguments, right? So for example, uh, we want like to to have an extra argument on this level, so it's function, and then uh, it will be one or two, one or more arguments as we want. And in that case, uh, this function should accept this number of arguments. So the first one will always be old state of the atom, and then we have arg one, arg two, etc. So in that case, we will have like uh, ten and uh, twenty, and we can print that old value arg1 arg2 let's reload that and when we calling this we see uh, this print line that prints our old state and extra prompts that we passed so yeah that's really powerful uh, we can store whatever we want inside the atom and then we can create a function that goes inside the swap and we can implement a lot of logic here. The only thing to notice is that uh, this function is not guaranteed to be called once because as I mentioned we use compare and set inside the uh, swap so this function could be called multiple times so uh, you should avoid side effects here it just uh, should define the logic how you want to change your um, state of the atom. Cool. Moving next, uh, and we have um, a short comment about pmap, right? So we've seen the example of uh, map map uh, before, uh, and there is a pmap function, and I've seen this uh, mistake by developers a lot. So if they want a cheap way to parallelize their map processing, uh, people just tend to use pmap without actually checking the docs, but it's actually said here explicitly that it's only useful for uh, your tasks that are CPU intensive. So, and that's because it calculates the concurrency uh, level based on the available processor, processor. So it's not a smart idea to use pmap to spawn uh, to spin a lot of parallel requests because you can achieve more concurrency with futures or the approach that we're going to discuss now. So a great library to have a better pmap is called uh, is called the clay pool. Um, and let's pick this example. So uh, the Claypool library is a closure wrapper that uh, provides some useful functions like uh, pmap, uh, unordered pmap, future, and all that stuff. But now we can provide a thread pool uh, to control, uh, to have more control uh, how we run our uh, um, tasks on a on a thread pool. So if we spawn futures, uh, as I said, the uh, thread pool that uh, is used is basically unbounded thread pool. So it's really hard to control uh, the maximum number of uh, requests that will be executed or maximum number of tasks that could be executed at a sing single time. Uh, but in Java, we have this execution uh, framework uh, which allows us to uh, create thread pools and we can configure them to be like a fixed thread pool or like growing thread pool or un unbounded thread pool and stuff like that. So that's what uh, this library is doing. If you notice here, we are creating a thread pool with 100 threads inside. And after that, 
uh, it's basically saying we're getting these same URLs uh, uh, from this Pokemon API, and we have a list of URLs. But after that, we use this Claypool PMAP, and we run this on top of Threadpool. So we uh, we can only execute 100 requests uh, at maximum in a single point of time. And this is uh, also uh, useful because the th threads will be reused. So we create a thread pool when our application starts. And after that, we just use this thread pool to uh, run our tasks. And also this thread pool could be defined in some global state or in your component. And the thread pool be, could be uh, reused in multiple uh, parts of your applications. So you always control how much threads your application uh, creates. Um, so yeah, let's see that in action. I need to reload that and call claypool parallel requests. And let's do the same uh, hack with um, R3 and we want time. See how much it takes. So yeah, it's pretty fast as well. But now we have a lot of a lot more control uh, with the thread pool. Cool. So yeah, that's all for the video. Hope that was helpful. And yeah, let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks a lot. Um, don't forget to like, subscribe and leave comments and see you in the next video. Bye bye.